I've done a couple videos lately on Protestant and Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox distinctives and how those traditions interact with each other, and I really enjoy those conversations. I'm a settled Protestant, I'm a convicted Protestant, but I find that I learn from every single conversation or engagement I have in that space. I walk away challenged and enriched in many ways. So I think those discussions are really valuable. I know that there's a number of viewers of my channel who are coming from a Catholic or Orthodox perspective, and I love that. Um, partly I know that because I get more dislikes on my videos that address these topics. So if you're willing to give me a like and help me out, I'd appreciate the support here. Um, but also just from comments and in other points of engagement, and I, I also know there's a number of viewers I have who are Protestant but considering moving to one of those other traditions. So I think these are really important discussions to have. So in this video, I want to address the issue of sola scriptura, which is one of the rallying cries of the Protestant Reformation by Scripture alone, sometimes called the formal principle of the Reformation. We'll talk more about what that doctrine means. To me, there's space around that issue to maybe make some progress and push the ball down the field a little bit. Now, let me explain my approach here. My goal in this video is not to try to blow the opposition to smithereens, okay? Think of this video not as a bazooka trying to create an explosion. Think of this video rather as an invitation to sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk. The goal is to reduce caricature to further understanding. And I do think that's important. I think both sides caricature each other. And this is, this is something I think about every single day, just the worrisome way that our culture is polarizing. We're not as good at respectful disagreement. And increasingly, you see this in politics a lot, there's the assumption that the other side is not only wrong, but they're actually evil or ignorant or both. <laughs> and unfortunately, that happens a lot in the church. You see the same thing where it's like, it's just assumed that, well, all the people on the other side of this are obviously they're wrong and here's why. And maybe they're even bad people, you know? And I think those of us who claim the name of Christ should try to extend the benefit of the doubt and just to recognize these are big issues. These are massive, large-scale disagreements, and therefore uh, it's possible that the issues involved are sufficiently complicated that good, sincere, intelligent people can actually disagree about them. And so then, when you're in that kind of discussion where you recognize that, even if nobody changes their mind, but if you're just understanding where those differences lie more accurately, that's a win. That's a good thing. So my goal is that perhaps some will, I mean, I hope this could help, you know, influence someone's thinking, but even if it doesn't, if someone simply walks away from this video saying, I don't agree with him, I'm still against Sola Scriptura, but I can understand a little better how someone could see it that way. To me, that's a win. So here's what we'll do. I'll give five objections to Sola Scriptura, respond to each of them, and then at the end, if you stick around for the end, I'll give two admissions of challenges to my view that I feel the weight of those challenges, because I think it's a good thing to be honest about that and admit, you know, there's some tough questions for my side. Now, for each of these five objections, I'm going to show a brief clip. The reason I'm showing these clips is not to um, reflect negatively in any way upon the person speaking. Rather, I think these are good expressions, reasonable, winsome expressions of a different point of view. And I would encourage everyone who watches this video to go to the video description and see the link to the full video from which these excerpts are taken and watch the full video so you see the fuller context. Here's the first one. Would you like me to say anything about Sola Scriptura? If you'd like, yeah. You you mentioned, I think it's the heresy that begets the other Protestant heresies. If I'm, That might be a slight misquote, but yeah, maybe uh, speak on that for a second. You know, I think most Protestants who enthusiastically champion Sola Scriptura are doing it, are doing it from piety. What mm -hmm. they're trying to say is that these words are from God and we trust them 100%. Uh, that is, in fact, not what Sola Scriptura means. Uh, that is the Orthodox mind <laughs> and the Catholic mind, uh, as well as the Protestant mind, that no one's questioning the preciousness and the centrality of Holy Scripture. There was a time in the Roman Catholic world where uh, 
the church discouraged believers from reading the scriptures. That is true. Uh, and the Protestants are right to criticize that. Although the opposite idea that everyone should read it and think that it's perspicuous, which is a Protestant doctrine that means that perspicari in Latin means to be able to see through, to be, you know, translucent. It, it, the idea that scripture is just going to make itself obvious to people who read it is not the case. Uh, so Orthodox Christians are very aware that we need to read scripture, but we need to read it in accordance with the way that the church has understood it. Sola Scriptura, on, in its formal definition, is saying that the, the scriptures hold a unique authority and uh, are the only authority to which we can appeal for establishing dogma. Okay, now I'm sure if Josiah had more time to unpack that, he could go into greater detail about all of that. He is coming from an Orthodox perspective, but um, has a background in Protestant Christianity, similar background to me in Presbyterianism. So I'm sure he, you know, could go into more nuance on all of these things. But just as it was stated there, I want to raise the concern of caricature for how Protestants understand Scripture. Two things came up there. One, the perspicuity of Scripture, and then second, sola scriptura. The perspicuity of Scripture is defined in the Westminster Confession of Faith as those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or another that not only the learned, but the unlearned, unlearned, in a due use of the ordinary means, may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. Now think about how nuanced that is. You need the due use of means, so this might take place over time, for example. You're not talking about every passage, but you're talking about one passage or another. Uh, you're just attaining to a sufficient, not an expertise, knowledge of Scripture. And here's the key point. The perspicuity of Scripture has to do with getting saved. It's about understanding the message of salvation from the scripture. It has never been understood to say that the Bible is perspicuous in general, in some unqualified sense. Similarly with Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura has always been maintained as the view that the Bible is the only infallible rule for theology. It has never been held by any historic Protestant confession or something like that. I understand that you can find anecdotal evidence of what this or that Protestant person or group will do, but we shouldn't judge an entire branch of Christendom based upon anecdotal observations like that. You have to look at the best of the tradition, or at least the all of the tradition, historically. And yes, it's true that Protestants caricature Catholics and Orthodox Christians all the time, and I, anybody who knows me or knows my channel knows I try to call that out and try to avoid that. That's equally a value for me, that we not do that. But uh, caricaturing should be called out wherever it happens. It's not like it's a contest. Like if Protestants have caricatured a lot, therefore it's not such a problem if they are caricatured. It is a problem. We want to understand these doctrines in their best light. And there's a big difference between saying the Bible is the only source for theology and saying the Bible is the only infallible source for theology. But I hear this over and over again. So let me just make a plea for my Catholic and Orthodox friends. If you hear nothing else in this entire video, just hear this. Um, don't say that Protestants believe that the Bible is all you have or all you need. It's just you and your Bible and that's that's it. Uh, thoughtful Protestants have always understood that tradition has an important place, and I'll talk more about that in a second. All we're saying is the Bible is the final court of appeal. The Bible is the highest. In fact, some Protestant traditions prefer to use the word the words prima scriptura. And that's another thing we've got to do is get into the nuances of how different Protestant traditions, like Anglicanism, for example, have cashed out this doctrine. So the main point is just to say something simple just here at the start. Thoughtful Protestants have always recognized that tradition has an important place. Calvin and Luther affirmed the early ecumenical creeds and councils. Thoughtful Protestants recognize that there's oral tradition mentioned in the Bible. All we're saying is the scripture as we have it is the final court of appeal, the norming norm that norms all other norms, but is not normed itself. Now, maybe that's still wrong, but let's just be clear. That's what the doctrine historically has been taken to mean. Okay, here's a second objection, and that's that uh, Sola Scriptura was not known to church history. Uh, it's, it was invented by the reformers. Here's one particular expression of that concern. So no Christian had parsed out this Sola Scriptura theology 
until the 16th century. Holy Scriptura just does not make sense historically. And I think the reason why a lot of Protestants don't immediately recognize this is because even in Protestant religion departments, there's less of an emphasis on church history. We really don't go that in depth into church history. It's more just about learning biblical languages, learning about Greco-Roman culture, the historical critical method of interpreting the Bible. But if you study early Christian history, it's just really obvious that in the early church, it would have been impossible for them to go by Sola Scriptura. Lizzie does a lot of interesting videos. She's got a very successful channel that you should check out. Here she's raising a concern that's often raised, and sometimes Catholic Christians and Orthodox Christians kind of give the impression that there was sort of one monolithic view of Scripture and tradition prior to Luther and Calvin, and then they invented this, or that they're the first to propound the idea of Sola Scriptura. I want to suggest that things are much more complicated than that. Actually, what you have is a development in the church's understanding of scripture and tradition. So in the earliest centuries, scripture and tradition had a lot of overlap and they were sort of interwoven because the canon had not been finalized yet. It took a long time to get to a fully articulated two-source view of divine revelation where you've got scripture and sacred tradition as this sort of two-pronged view of revelation. And when you go back to the church fathers, what you see is a mixed record. But if you want to check out some pretty fascinating quotes, pick up this book, The Church of Rome at the Bar of History by William Webster, and just read the first appendix, which is, I haven't read, I haven't finished the rest of the book yet. It's an interesting book. The first appendix is a series of quotes from the church fathers, not all of which are sola scriptura. In fact, none of them are that pure and proper. I don't think that Sola Scriptura is the kind of thing that you can like, it, there is a danger of reading that back into the fathers. They were not facing this question as we are facing it today. The earliest of the church fathers, again, they didn't have the scripture, you know. But here's the point. There, and I'll give two examples. There is, among the church fathers, even while they are appealing to oral tradition as well, an awareness and a conviction, though it's not all, always fully articulated in a self-conscious way, that there's a, de a deposit of authoritative revelation in the Holy Scripture that possesses a kind of unparalleled authority. Let me give some examples. So Basil the Great in his book On the Holy Spirit is arguing against those who think that within the creed we should use the, f the phrase through whom rather than with whom, referring to the Son of God. And in order to make his case, he appeals to prior tradition of what previous uh, church fathers have said. But then he says, but we are not content simply because this is the tradition of the fathers. What is important is that the fathers followed the meaning of scripture. This is a good example of where scripture and tradition were not seen as two separate norms. They were seen as, um, some people have called this the coincident view, that scripture and tradition have both have authority insofar as they coincide. Okay, here's another example from St. Augustine. He's dealing with the idea of succession in his book on the unity of the church. And he says, whoever dissents from the sacred scriptures, even if they are found in all places in which the church is designated, are not the church. Francis Turretin quotes this passage in Augustine and a few others in him as well to argue that um, succession of doctrine is a superior way to determine the true church than succession of office. And look, I don't mean to suggest that these things are neat. I'm not saying the church fathers were all in favor of sola scriptura. I'm just saying the historical evidence is messy, and this wasn't a 16th century innovation. Take a look at some of the quotes in here. You find among the fathers, even going back to Irenaeus and some people like that, this recognition that the scripture has this kind of unique, unparalleled authority. That leads into the third objection, which is, Sola Scriptura is not in the Bible. I hear this one all the time. Here's one expression of this. The, the most problematic aspect of it is that the Bible actually never teaches this. Nowhere in sacred scripture can we find in a verse or in a collection of verses any indication that Sola Scriptura is a true doctrine. And so therefore it becomes a self-refuting doctrine because the doctrine itself says that Christians are only obligated to accept those doctrines which are taught in scripture. But the doctrine of sola scriptura is not taught in sacred scripture, and therefore that should be a doctrine that Protestants reject. So what Sean is outlining there is a very common claim, and it's certainly true that we don't find any verses in the Bible that say 
Thus follows the relation of scripture and tradition, colon, and then it fills in. But then again, there's a lot of things that we would say are entailed by the Bible, but aren't spelled out in that sort of explicit self-conscious way. I'd also admit that verses like 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, and John 10, 35 don't in themselves get you to sola scriptura. So respectively, these verses say the scriptures are God-breathed, that uh, those who wrote prophecies of scripture were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then John 10, Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken. Okay, so we've got here these claims in the Bible that the scripture possesses this kind of God-breathed, unbreakable, divine authority. But they don't say that they're the only thing that has that kind of authority. So I'd admit that those verses in themselves don't get you to sola scriptura. They do raise the question, though, of course, um, well, what else could there be that has that level of divine, unbreakable, spirit-carried authority? But where I would go to in my appeal would be for those who say, as is said over and over again, sola scriptura is not in the Bible. You can't find it anywhere. Uh, would you interact with Matthew 15, 1 through 9 more? Because this is one of those passages that does get into, so here's the way I would make the case. Here Jesus is interacting with some of the traditions of the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees get a bad rap, but they were the Jewish religious leaders of the day and they had oral tradition. And he's contradicting their oral tradition by basically saying he prioritizes the word of God over human traditions. So for example, concerning certain washing rituals, he says in verse 3, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And again in verse 6, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So the question that I would ask is, do you grant that it's at least a meaningful conceptual distinction to draw between the word of God and human tradition with the former regulating the latter? And if you grant that as at least like a, a conceptual possibility, can you understand how if someone isn't already convinced that sacred tradition has that kind of unbreakable divine authority, how you'd look at Matthew 15 and say, this looks like it pushes you towards sola scriptura. What else is there that has that level of authority? I think it would push the discussion down more helpful avenues and more interesting avenues if more Catholics, I know some have engaged passages like this, but too often I just hear people assert Sola Scriptura is not in the Bible, and they don't engage the classic Protestant texts like this. A fourth objection to Sola Scriptura is that it leads to interpretative anarchy, that everyone becomes their own pope, functionally, if you adhere to Sola Scriptura. Let, here's just a, a brief clip where Trent Horn articulates this concern. The people that I, you know, that I that I study, you know, uh, um, I, I find they're... they're it's it's uh, you. Yes, it's you. but my ultimate um, authority is the scriptures. Well, so the, but, but 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 yeah, I got to admit though, at the end, it's not the scriptures; it's what you think the scriptures mean, right? Since the scriptures don't say that explicitly, as you sure. just admitted, so so I sure. guess and I get that. I've heard that argument, and but but here, Brandon, yeah. but it can be gone too far because I agree. At the end of the sure. day, whenever we decide to do something, it's us as human beings taking the data and making a decision, whether yeah. it's to trust sola scriptura or to be Catholic. For me, yeah. I want to see who's got the best logical steps in their argument. I really appreciate what Trent is saying at the end there, because when I, in previous videos, have said it's really important for me to follow my conscience, uh, I've had some people you know, label that as though that's kind of an individualistic or even a relativistic thing, which I don't think relativism is the right category here. Relativism means there's no absolute truth. I think the differences between Catholics and Protestants and Protestants and Orthodox don't have to do with whether there's absolute truth, but how we adjudicate what it is. So I think the charge of individualism is more the concern here, but I appreciate what Trent is saying there at the end. He's a really thoughtful proponent of Catholic views, um, where basically everybody follows their conscience, because if someone comes to the view that I should join the Catholic Church and then function accordingly, that also is a decision of conscience. So the difference here is not whether we're trying to follow our own conscience as best as our own individual reason leads us to do so. I think the root issue here is, are we 
interpreting scripture from an individualistic standpoint. And in other words, therefore, are we being selective in terms of what we appropriate as Protestants from the early church? We're just picking and choosing. And I've heard people say that to me. Your criterion is just what you find agreeable about the early church. You accept the early creeds and councils that were ecumenical creeds and councils. You accept the doctrine of the Trinity, but you reject the papacy and the immaculate conception and these other things that you don't like. So you're your own authority. But Protestants do have criteria for how we determine which are the doctrinal developments in the early church that we should accept and which are the ones we shouldn't accept. The root issue is what are the organic developments out of scripture. So we'd say the Trinity and the person of Christ at, as defined at Chalcedon and so forth, those are organic developments out of what's already in Scripture. The papacy and the Immaculate Conception, we would say, isn't. Now, is that because we're radical individualists and we're just going by what I see in the text? No, because another criteria we have is the Church Catholic. What, ha what is the sum aggregate witness of all Christians within Orthodoxy? Eastern Christians don't believe in the papacy or the Immaculate Conception. And I've argued that uh, various points of these doctrines you don't see until several centuries into the Church. So arguably, you don't see them in the second century uh, with respect to, say, the Immaculate Conception, for example. So uh, a Protestant might be wrong in those historical judgments, but the Protestant is not being a, a radical individualist in reading Scripture. The Protestant is trying to say, how have other Christians, all other Christians, not just one in one particular institutional branch of the church, but how have all Christians interpreted the scripture before me? And that's a, a significant uh, uh, influence upon how we read the scripture. Okay, here's one final objection. And this is, I'll show you a clip from Matt Frad's excellent YouTube channel, which I watch all the time, called Pints with Aquinas, where he's interviewing Gary Mashuda about I think they're talking about the canon, issues of canonicity, but they also get into Sola Scriptura. And Gary makes a very reasonable point here. Take a look. But, you know, in terms of the Scriptura, there's no inspired table of contents. Hmm. There, there's nothing to indicate exactly which books belong in the Bible. And so, uh, you know, if you go by the Bible alone, you really can't establish the uh, Old Testament canon or perhaps even the New Testament canon just based on those uh, thanks. I hear this appeal all the time, you know, the church gave us the Bible. We wouldn't even know what the Bible was if not for the church. The historic Protestant view, which I wish was more engaged, sometimes, it, again, this is why I'm trying to make this video. I feel like we need to press the conversations further. What Protestants have always said is, the church didn't give us the Bible, it recognized the Bible, and that is a meaningful distinction. So one Protestant put it like this, the church no more gave us the Bible than Newton gave us gravity. Another Protestant put it like this, the church's role with respect to the canon of scripture is a thermometer, not a thermostat. The metaphor that I like to use is, imagine a child's walking to school with a note from mom that says they have permission to get out of school. A bully rips up the note, but they're able to piece the note back together, tape it back together, and therefore give it to the principal. The fact that they can piece the note together, recognize what it is, doesn't mean that, it's, that they have the same level of authority as mom. Um, they're recognizing what the note is, but they didn't imbue it with that authority. That's the Protestant view on these things. All right, to end with, let me try, in the spirit of trying to be as conciliatory here as possible, because I, it, I, I'm sure I've probably annoyed many of my Catholic and Orthodox viewers, but if you're not annoyed, again, hit the like button, because I need, I need some backup here, okay? Let me mention some of the challenges for my view, because I acknowledge this is not simple. Again, this is not something where it's like everybody who's intelligent is on one side. And even simply recognizing that to me is a win. So let me mention two challenges. First of all, I acknowledge most Protestants don't function with a very robust definition of sola scriptura. Many function with what some people call solo scriptura or nuda scriptura, scripture alone. They don't understand a, what, you know, a more thoughtful account of sola scriptura that you might get in Anglicanism or in the Westminster Confession of Faith or something like that. And, and they do. Protestants do uh, value church history insufficiently. 
And so if there's any blame for caricatures about sola scriptura, a lot of it comes on us Protestants because we don't even understand what, what that doctrine means in many cases. A second acknowledgement I would make is that I often try to make this appeal that the witness of the early church in those first several centuries is not in accord with current Catholic or Orthodox dogma. But I have to acknowledge that's not universally the case. I try every time I make that appeal to say, you know, to nuance it like that and admit it's not all, you know, the, the second century church didn't look exactly like a Protestant church. Just this week, I was reading through the letters of Ignatius, going back through some of the other writings of the Apostolic Fathers, the letter of Polycarp, the first epistle of Clement, those kinds of things. There's a letter by someone who's just named Mathetes, which I think just means disciple. And looking at what you see in there, and there's, I mean, at least in the letters of Ignatius, though I'd argue not in those other ones, you do see an Episcopal form of church government, as well as a high view of the Eucharist come in early. I mean, people think those letters were written around 107 AD. So very early on, and he would have been someone who knew the apostles. So I want to acknowledge um, for Protestants like me, who don't believe in Episcopal church government, that's tough. That's a fair challenge to me. However, I would also say there are Protestants who do believe in Episcopal church government. There's also Protestants who believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So those letters of Ignatius are not necessarily Roman Catholic over Protestant, but they do challenge me as a Baptist, and I'll just admit it. Yeah, you know, that's a challenge to my perspective. Okay, that's my appeal for those video clips that I quoted. I hope I didn't misrepresent you. If I did, please let me know in the comments. And I hope that this video, again, the hope is not that everyone is now, okay, solo scriptura, up, sign on the dotted line. Rather, the hope is someone might look at this doctrine and say, okay, yeah, I can actually understand how that could be a coherent view, how someone who is sincere and intelligent could come out to that outlook. Even if that's all we get here, that's a win.